Is there some sound? Yes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Field Design, I uh, welcome you all uh, in this early Monday morning. And apparently, there was 200 kilometers uh, traffic jam, so we're still waiting for some people to arrive. But we have to start because we have a tight schedule. So welcome um, on this uh, event, uh, From Data to Meaning for People. Um, I introduce myself. My name is Peter Her My name is Peter Hermans. I'm the CEO of Yakaima. I'm the moderator. I will try to guide you through this morning, uh, because in the afternoon I will be invisible. Um, you see a picture of Star Trek, and the guy on the left side, the, in the in the sort of yellow orange sort of shirt, that's Commander Data. And apparently the guys or the people who developed or thought about Star Trek a million a couple of years ago, I would say a million years ago, but a long time ago. They already were very, let's say, modern thinking and they already thought about data. And the interesting thing is, I'm, I'm not sure whether there are any fans of Star Trek, but a Commander Data is not a human being, he is a robot, but he is programmed with all sorts of technology and all sorts of data. And he's trying to, to be as human as possible, which is difficult. Now, that is something where we talk about today as well. But may, let's start and to make things tangible, because we're talking about big data, and uh, everybody sees, yes, big data, that's a trend and it's a topic, but let's do a, a very straightforward uh, approach of you as, a, as people. We, had, we have 300 people registered for this event, so let's, say, let's, let's find out how many data people make during one day. Um, on average, people are tweeting three times a day, which means with 300 people is 900 data snippets. On average, one Facebook activity per day. And so email, three emails, which is very conservative, but just as a, as a, as a ballpark figure. That's all when you do people have their own activities. Then if you look to a smartphone, um, who's using WhatsApp? Okay, well, I don't have to tell you. I'm, I'm just saying one is, uh, is one average WhatsApp activity per day, but it's on average, in, in reality, it's much higher. Then location in a smartphone. When you install a smartphone, uh, very often they ask whether it's when you allow that your smartphone gives the, the location of the smartphone to the software, the app builder. Now that happens if you say yes, of course. If you don't, it won't happen. But if you say yes, that is on average 10 times a day, it will say, here's my location. In reality, it's probably much, much higher, but I'm not a, let's say, a telecom expert. Then if you look at activities for a smartphone, um, uh, many apps are using, uh, um, they, they, they follow what you're doing on your, on your touch screen, so they know exactly what you've, what you've touched and what you've used. And that is also 10 times a day, which is probably in, in, in reality much higher, but it also creates data. And then we talk about PCs, cookies, five, let's say five new cookies or five adapted cookies per day. And then we are not talking about tablets, we're not talking about connected devices. So in reality, what you see, if you have 300 people in the room, you as a group per day create almost 10,000 data snippets. And that is on the, on the lower side. If you take the Dutch population, 60 million or 17, I'm always confused, but let's say 16, that means that on average per day, we almost produce 500 million data snippets. So the enormous amount of data. But great, now we have this pile of huge data, and then what? What, do I, what can I do with that? So that is the reason why we are here, from data to meaningful people. What does this big data mean for people? And this conference, organized by Philips Design, and deliberately organized during the Dutch Design Week, because there is a very strong link, as you can, uh, can imagine, uh, goes about this. We have uh, one to six speakers, we will start with Sean Carney, the C CDO of uh, Philips, and then we have people talking about each, let's say, angle of, on, on, of their business on big data. I'm sorry. Um, so, I don't want to make you, uh, I, I, don't, I would like to start now with the first speaker, which is uh, Sean Carney. He is the chief design officer of uh, Philips Design. He came to Philips one and a half year ago, if I'm correct, and he lived in uh, the United States in San Diego, Silicon Valley, and even for that he, he wanted to, to come for the, the, the nice weather in Silicon Valley, he came to Eindhoven for the somewhat, well, not so good weather. So, Sean, please, the floor is yours. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thanks. OK, 
Okay, good morning. And uh, for those of you who are uh, familiar with Silicon Valley, you'll know San Diego is a long, long way south of Silicon Valley, and the weather's a whole lot better as well. But um, <clears throat> I was back over in California just uh, three weeks ago or so, just at the back end of the Quantified Self uh, conference, where I had the opportunity to actually meet with, uh, with Gary Wolf, who started the whole Quantified Self movement. And uh, as we got talking, we found that actually the, the whole purpose and vision of Quantified Self, and you're going to hear more about it later this morning, is, uh, is very, very similar to uh, the kind of vision that we now see that Philips, or the opportunity that we now see ahead of Philips. So I think this um, explains a little bit why we believe this is such an important conference for us today. Um, Philips has got a lot of challenges, uh, has been going through a lot of changes over the last few years. But um, I think big data is one of the keys, one of the levers that we can use to unlocking a whole new potential for, for growth, not only for Philips, but for, for many companies going forwards. Okay, so we're here today to talk about big data. And I guess the, given, given that the fact that you're here, you're already very familiar with what big data is, what it means, and what the potential is for, for all of us. Um, I guess you're also familiar with these sort of, uh, these sort of numbers that Effectively, within the next couple of years, we're going to see an excess of 25 billion connected devices. And that's, that's more than doubling from 2010. And this is connected devices. We talked then earlier in your, in your introduction about um, smartphones, about tablets, about laptops. Of course, that's the easy ones for a consumer to get their head around. The challenge for a business like Philips is that most of this is going to be device to device, machine to machine protocols and discussions going on. And that machine to machine interface that's going on, how do we in, in insert ourselves in there? How do we understand the dialogue that's going on there? How can we create value and meaning for people? Those are some big discussions that we have going within Philips Design right now. Um, if you think about it, I mean, Philips is in the healthcare profession. Um, so we're, we're there de developing, designing, and supplying uh, medical devices. We're capturing images um, at an incredible rate every day. Now, if you think about the amount of data that we're collecting there and that we're storing, if we can create meaning out of that by maybe doing comparisons of data, looking at patient profiles, looking at um, the way in which uh, maybe a tumor advances, and when you've got millions of uh, data points now, we can start to create uh, a lot of meaning. We can start to do predictive um, algorithms around helping doctors understand where they're heading with, uh, with, with uh, the diagnosis. So we're going to go, I think some of you have already seen a white paper that we've published on, on this uh, subject. Um, and the trick here is, is not only to look at the obvious data streams, uh, listening to social media. We've got various programs, various platforms that are now coming through uh, that, that listen out to Twitter, Facebook. It will be interesting to see what's going on in here today as we do some listening here. Um, but really, this machine-to-machine -machine protocol, looking at the business-to-business -business, uh, angle as well as the business-to-consumer angle, but key to it all, the reason Philips Design is interested in this is how we capture those data streams and how we make sense of them, how we actually interpret those and create real uh, value for consumers. Now, we've got a vision as Philips, and this has just been restated, that by the year 2025, we want to be improving the lives of 3 billion people each year. Now, that means really improving. So healthcare is an obvious one. You know, we're, we're helping uh, do early diagnosis of uh, cancer, uh, other chronic illnesses. We're helping mothers and children in uh, the NICU. Um, and we're getting more involved in well-being. So before people end up in the hospital, how do we help them, prevent them getting there in the first place? Now, as we do this, if we develop uh, freestanding products, the real value will come from connecting those products back to the net and starting to, to patch all this information that they're generating together. Because at the end, if we just have raw data feeding in, it's not going to create a lot of value for anybody. We really need to help understand, bring understanding to that. Now, we're playing in a number of fields right now. So we've got um, 
the obvious ones, like you can link an MRI scanner, a, a CT scanner up to the net, and you can collect data from that. But what about uh, this other device we have over here? This is the Direct Life, um, sorry, this is the Lifeline product, which uh, basically senses when an elderly user has fallen over in their home and can send help. Now, as a freestanding unit, that's just helping people in their lives. But if we connect that to other devices in the home, if, for instance, the lighting is connected in the home, we can tell exactly where in the home that person has fallen. Um, if we connect up even things, rudimentary things, like a toothbrush, um, and start to collect data from that, we can help you do a better job of uh, brushing your teeth. We can also provide the oral health care provider, your dentist, with information that helps them coach you in, uh, in improving your oral health care. Um, we've got new sensors and technologies coming through, both uh, on iOS devices, Android devices, that just through the camera application can sense your heart rate, can sense your breathing rate. Now, look at those in the application of a mother and child, so it's looking at your baby sleeping. We can understand, is the baby sleeping soundly? Is the baby sleeping safely? And again, we can, by analyzing the data that we're collecting from that, understand how to prevent uh, sudden infant death syndrome in the future. And then you look at it in, this, in a uh, public domain, so in, in the case of street lights. If these street lights, these devices are now part of a connected web, if these are sending data streams back, they become intelligent devices which are sensing their local environment. That opens up a lot of possibilities to improve the living experience for people, the driving experience, but helps us become more energy efficient as well. So a lot of reasons why Philips needs to be on the ball with this. <clears throat> but as I just said, I just came back from three weeks in Silicon Valley, or well, three weeks ago from Silicon Valley, and you're driving down the 101 towards uh, San Jose from San Francisco Airport, and every billboard, every 50 meters, is all about cloud. Are you leveraging your cloud? Are you virtualizing your cloud? How are you uh, capturing data? What's your HAPU layer doing? Is that HAPU, is that right? I've got a lot of geeks in the room, have I said that right? Um, you know, all the data streams are there that people are talking about it, it's front of mind. I drive down the um, uh, Route 2 here, the A2, and apart from sitting looking at the tail end of a Peugeot in front of me for two and a half hours, I, I see very little of that kind of discussion over here. So I think this community has really got to get the, uh, the Dutch industry up to scratch and up to speed on what's happening in the world of data. So I'm excited to see so many people participating in this event. Now, why design is involved in this? Uh, I mean, we're partnering with our research colleagues, Philips Research, uh, Philips Corporate IT, and um, our innovation services teams, uh, because we really believe that uh, design needs to be in, right in the middle of this in order to bring real meaning to data. Um, we've got a global community of design in Philips Design of more than 500 people working across healthcare, lighting, consumer lifestyle, and innovation and research. And what my job right now is to try and activate this 500 plus people to start thinking about the opportunities of connecting all the devices that Philips makes. I mean, as a design team, we've been very, very successful. We won just under 100 awards last year for our products. Uh, we sell very well. But these are all individual freestanding products. We have a few connected products. We have some connected TVs. We have some streaming music devices. But where we're really going to start to capture data is when we get this entire portfolio um, connected. And connected in a way that actually starts to bring meaning back to, back to consumers. So we've got some clever guys in, in the team working on how to bring this into, into life. And what we've done is build this, this model where as we connect all these devices up, we start to break it down into the different uh, elements that are actually going to start to, to drive real value for the consumer here. And what you can see is this, um, it goes everything from the customer experience journey or the patient experience journey uh, down at the bottom here. So looking at post-purchase, or, or uh, it could be before you go into hospital, or when you're in hospital, purchasing a product, experiencing a product. 
Um, the collection of that data that you can be uh, capturing from a connected device, making sense of that data through various analytics. And here's where some of the designers, Jana and uh, the team, were running some workshops uh, just last week where we did a data visualization hackathon, which um, is really key to this because the amount of data being generated is very easily just going to end up on millions of Excel sheets. And it's not going to do anybody any good if the only people who are seeing that data is really just the analysts and statisticians who are just going to be trying to break out codes of that or make sense of that. What we've got to do is, is bring that data to life, uh, and visualization is one of the keys to that, in a way that anybody who's running a business, anybody who's trying to manage their health proactively, uh, who cares about uh, th their family, can leverage that data to bring uh, real meaning to their lives. And Philips is good at the, the kind of what we call the actuators, so the products. Now, that could be the connected light bulb, the connected toothbrush, the connected, um, I don't know, anything you like, uh, female epilator. I'm trying to think of a, worth, a use case for that one. That's the thing that pulls uh, hairs out of women's legs. Yes, we do that as well. Um, so any one of these devices could be actuated on the, on the web. We've got to challenge why and what data will it collect and what's the meaning of that. So by kind of pulling this circle together, having this start to flow together, we believe we'll start to build understanding in the company. So as we said, we, we pulled a few people. I think there were more than 60 people came together at Philips Design a couple of, uh, last week. And uh, we did this hackathon around uh, data visualization where we gave some open source data about healthcare and health and well-being uh, to various uh, people and asked them to try and make sense of this and create new value, new meaning. And over a 48-hour period, it was incredible to see how the teams really pulled resources, pulled capabilities, and came up with a number of very workable uh, applications and uh, new, new uh, devices for this. So I'm going to run a quick film to show you how that went. I think there should be sound on this. No. <laughs> oh, well, you're just missing some funky music. Apologies, Jana. But yeah, these guys were working um, for no more than uh, beer, food, and wine. Um, through till midnight, we had to kick them out of the building. Uh, back in the next morning, really hacking through all of the, the data, trying to understand new use cases, and um, these are some of the winners. So the winner in the end was uh, somebody who'd looked at the data that's coming out of London right now uh, around urban transport systems, so London transport, and with a focus on um, this is causing stress in commuters. How can I help people feel better about their commute into work and de-stress them? Because ultimately, that will help their uh, mental health and their physical well-being. So leveraging all of the data streams they could find, create an app that when you access this app on your phone, would tell you what's the fastest route to work where you avoid all of these delays, which bus to take, which underground station to avoid, which traffic jam is, is going to get in your way. So rather than accessing multiple data points, all of this comes together under one. These guys hacked together all that information, made an app, and basically it's ready to go within 48 hours. So this kind of speed and urgency is, I sense, not typical of the way that Philips has been working in the past. But this is the lessons we've got to learn. We've got to bring a little bit of the Silicon Valley kind of mentality over here and have people really sort of um, hungry to get these things through and out of the door as soon as we can. So we've got a whole day, uh, a lot of good speakers, great speakers, going to be talking to you about how they're making sense of data. And I hope at the end of it, um, uh, Eindhoven and Holland will, will see the benefit of this and will start to see Eindhoven um, competing with Silicon Valley in the, in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions?
Nobody dares to answer a question the first time. <laughs> so I have a question. Um, it's not easy to come to, to start from a product company towards a service company. So how is your is design Philips Design playing a role in that as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think Philips Design within Philips has actually been thinking this way for some time. Uh, the role of design is very often just seen as creating a beautiful product, an engaging product, and, and maybe at best making a uh, looking at the ergonomics of the physical product. But as anybody practicing in design will know, the real trick is looking at systems. Now that in the past has been physical design families making everything look like it belongs to a brand. But now we're increasingly um, seeing uh, patterns and recognizing how we need to connect devices together. Uh, and the challenge for us that, uh, as with many businesses, Philips is siloed into sectors, into business groups, into operating units with individual profit and loss. Now, often when you start to look at a service model, it bridges a number of categories, a number of business groups. And the challenge for us is to find new ways of um, uh, recognizing the revenue that we can get from those services beyond the P&L, uh, the profit and loss of uh, a typical product, a transactional sale. You know, quite often we view a product as, here's the product, this is what it costs me to make, and here's the profit I'm going to make on that product. Whereas what we've got to look at is what's the lifetime value we can capture from that product if it's connected. And that value, that lifetime value, may make it worth your while to also even let that product go out the door either free of charge or at a loss initially, because from a, from a company perspective, we can make money further downstream. Now, that's a big shift for a company like Philips to get its mind around. But if you think about it, we've in the past sold light fittings uh, and not made such a healthy profit on the light fitting because we've known we, were, we would recover the cost of that by the sales of the light bulbs that will sell during the life of that light fitting. So it's really not that much different to that. We've just got to now th forget about the physical things a little bit and uh, measure the value in terms of the services that we deliver. Okay, thank you very much. Quite a challenge. Thank you very much. I now would like to introduce the next uh, speaker, which is uh, Maarten den Bramer of Quantified Self. He is one of the founders of Quantified Self Europe. Uh, he's an experienced speaker and, well, the floor is yours, uh, Maarten. Thank you. Um, I'm very grateful to be here and to be able to, um, let me start my presentation before I talk, which should be, go like this. I'll have to consult my notes on my phone every once in a while, so if you see me glancing at my phone, uh, that's what I'm doing. Um, I'm very happy to be able to represent such a community because um, you might hear from some speakers today who are representing companies or business interests or uh, other things. A quantified Self is really a movement, and I'm very happy uh, to have been in a position to be able to found the Amsterdam chapter, which is currently about 550, 600 people. Um, we have bi-monthly meetups, so every one or two months we host meetups. Um, I've also um, organized the European conference, which the first time we organized, Philips was one of the sponsors at that time also, um, right away got about 300 people interested from 22 different countries all coming to the Netherlands to discuss what Quantified Self is, what it can bring uh, to health, to healthcare, but a lot of things beyond that, because as I will also uh, go in a little bit, it is, it is about more than uh, health. It can be about self-tracking uh, anything, actually. So um, there's a lot of things that fall under the uh, nomer of quantified self. I'm also currently working on something I've called QS Gear, uh, which is finding your way into all these technologies, especially devices and wearables, which are out there, but some are manufactured in Singapore, not available here. I'm currently... Um, Maybe some of you have seen this, know what this is? Seen it? Nike Fuel Band, I know Johan in the uh, seat there has one. This is, um, this is a little device that Nike makes now. You can buy it in Nike stores, I think now in London, not yet in the Netherlands. It tracks your activity during the day. Um, these devices are readily available. Um, the difficult thing right now is which ones are available, what functions do they have. This one doesn't track my heart rate, but there are devices similar to this one which do. 
devices are being funded. If you take a look at things like Kickstarter, you might see a whole array of devices like this, which are in the works, currently being developed. People are testing the water if there's um, really an audience for such devices. So more and more is happening. That's what QS Gear is about. But I will talk more about the quantified self movement in general. Well, if we talk about people, these are real people. These are my parents. Um, my mom used to write everything down, what she um, paid for their gas bill and electricity bill, I think since 1976, around that time. Um, my dad always exactly can tell you what is about the, as the, um, in the US they say your MPG, your mile per gallon, he'll track everything about the car and how far, how far you drive on a tank of gas and what it will cost you. And it's just the fact that they, maybe are somewhat more interested in numbers maybe than other people, or they just like to know how well they did in uh, respect to other months. And actually, I'm not that different. If you look, or if I look at what I'm doing, I'm tracking different things. I'm not a very big self-tracker. I think there are people who, who would consider themselves a self-tracker, so tracking something on a regular basis, every once in a while, every, how many people? Just think of anything that you think can you name some examples? I just try and see somebody over there. Weight. You're checking your weight, okay? What, do you use anything for that? Anything special? Tools or just writing it down? Uh, I have a living skill and a job on up. A job on up? And of course, Twitter and Instagram is a way to track it. Okay, so other things that people track different than weight? Running, Running is a very, very uh, popular one. Run Keeper and apps like that, I'm guessing. Food, yes, I know. Drink. Your drink, your water intake, or no. everything you drink? Water. Wine. <laughs> I gotta talk some more about that. And what do you track? Do you track what types of wine you drink, or how much you drink, or? How much and what, what, what I like, and what it affected And how, well, how it affected you? Okay. <laughs> well. Um, I'm tracking a few things. I'm tracking my, uh, my weight as well. If you look at the picture down below, these are not my shoes, by the way. The first Quantified Self meetup, we do these. And these are people just doing experiments. I will talk a little bit about what Quantified Self people consider themselves. But they're just hobbyists, you could say. Just people doing little projects, um, trying to, to um, find ways to self-track and find maybe better ways or use technology. Um, the shoes are actually of the founder of WeThinks. He came to our first meetup, took a train from France. It's a French company. It's one of the few, actually, European companies which is doing really well in this space. They're in the Apple Store. Go to any Apple Store now worldwide. You'll find their skills readily available. It costs about 130 euros. Uh, tracks your weight. Um, gives you a graph on your iPhone. It also connects. They have a blood pressure sensor. They have a baby monitor. So they have a more of an array of devices. Um, so that thing of tracking, which my parents did, is, is something uh, which I do maybe on a different scale. Um, but the tracking is, is what it's all about. So um, what you see as sort of a general trend is that a lot of the invisible now is starting to become visible. So first we could track things which were very clear to see. So what my parents did was tracking their energy, gas, you got a uh, you got a letter in the mail from your gas company, for example, saying how much did you use this month, this year, and that will be very clear. Now the trend becomes more and more that these things which were previously invisible or at least harder to measure becoming more visible. So my activity, how active I am, which is what this uh, bracelet is measuring, or I have another one which is called the Fitbit Up. This is um, a company which is interesting for who of you works, really works for Philips? Just for me to give a, about three quarters of the audience, okay. Um, so this, uh, this device competed or still competes with uh, the Direct Life. Any of you who have the Direct Life here? I'm guessing there are some people. Okay. Um, the different thing was this one um, boasts a community and people around it building apps and stuff like that. That's an interesting contrast with what uh, Sean just explained. This was targeted as a service, not so much as a device, where the Philips one was really at the first point, really a device and had a different model of uh, marketing it. Um, so the invisible visible means that now it becomes more about your body, about things which are harder to measure, but we have the technology now to do it. 
And the next step will be even closer. So there's companies uh, like MC10 is doing uh, measurements inside, even inside organs, inside your body. So it's becoming more of uh, also going from the outside to the inside. So what is very clear and very apparent for anyone to see is uh, now also going more to what you cannot so much see. So in that sense, that world that my parents lived in and that was very clear and that was very, uh, actually you just had to decide whether you want to do it. Now it's also whether you have the technology to do it. So in that sense, there's multiple things that are um, changing in that environment. So I just asked some examples of uh, quantifying. The fact that this quantifying is uh, getting easier and uh, getting more widespread spurred the idea with um, two people actually starting a meetup also in the Silicon Valley where uh, Kevin Kelly lives. Kevin Kelly was at that moment uh, connected to Wired, the technology magazine, just as Gary Wolf was. And those two people got together and actually talked about, well, what is actually, they, they sort of discovered the trend of people tracking things and they hosted one meetup. So they got uh, together and they invited some people to come to their place and talk about some of the small projects. And they were really small projects, people just trying to figure out if they could see trends in their weight loss or they had developed some kind of tools like a little bit more advanced spreadsheets to calculate their uh, weight averages or things like that, all kinds of uh, tools. That spurts the quantified self movement. And a quantified self movement is actually a, com a community of people building and using tools for self measurement or self tracking. It's nothing more than that. It's not a business, it's not, it's just a group of people and there's now worldwide, I guess if you, you can go to meetup.com most of the um, places in the world have a meetup um, and there's about 10,000 people I think in all these different meetups and there's a multiple of those actually doing these things because if you look at this room already there's a lot of people doing that which might not call themselves self quantifiers but they're actually doing the same thing so quantified self is about three questions what did you do how did you do it and what did you learn and if you can talk about something about for example something you uh, you tracked talk about what you learned, like tracking your wine and seeing what, is there anything you can share from the fact that you've, and it gives me an opportunity to yeah. tie my shoelace in the, in the middle, but. Yeah, I can talk to you afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> afterwards. Yeah. Okay, but is there one particular insight that you've learned about how the wine affects you, that you found out that you like a particular? Okay, so the price doesn't mean the, doesn't, Okay, but that's the big thing. According to me, the last sentence is very important because these are all experiments. Actually, it's also sometimes dubbed the NS1 movement. All these experiments based on NS1. At least they start with NS1. One famous example, or for me famous, because I met Sarah. Sarah is um, somebody I met at um, Quantified Self Europe, who is from Sweden, who has a specific form of Parkinson's disease. And her form of Parkinson's disease you have many formats, I'm not a physician, so I can't give you the exact detail, but for her, it's stiffness in her fingers. What she did actually was trying to find out whether she could change her medicine regime or that you could find out when this stiffness happened the most and what she could do about it. So she thought about how she could measure it. She downloaded an, a game, a simple game from the App Store, which is called Finger Tap, uh, not meant for Parkinson's patients or anything, and she tapped that, and it gave her a score how much she tapped the screen in 30 seconds. It's just a game you can play anywhere and try to improve your record. She actually used it to measure. So she did that during different times in the day and then from that she could defer what time of the day she had more stiffness because she would not be able to keep that record that she was setting for herself. Then she did that with her husband who had no Parkinson's disease or no symptoms at all, who gave her a baseline and now she's trying to make that into a bigger thing where she spreads the finger tap app which is now evolving into a specific one for people to also save their results and so on and make that into a community for people with Parkinson's and then make it into a crowdsourced app where you actually have a lot of these examples and uh, data sets that you can combine and then you get to the point where it is about big data. Um, just to show that it's not something that a lot of hobbyists are just doing and um, doing it for fun. This is one article that came out right after that we did the um, uh, Quantified Self Conference in Europe. Uh, the Economist has since then also written a number of articles about this, um, this topic and uh, it sort of 
showing that this movement fits into bigger debate. Uh, I know the economists did a few months back, they did a big data special, they have uh, addressed quantified self. So there's an increasing number of uh, people and companies and interests from different angles that's trying to address what should we do with this movement, how should we, um, how should we go about, what's the next step, and so on. Um, for me, I think what was very enlightening, I've been to the Quantified Self Conference uh, where Sean just uh, uh, was also a few weeks ago at Stanford. Um, last year we had about 350, 400 people. This year we limited the number at 600 people. The next one in Amsterdam will also probably be one and a half times, two times as many people as the time before. So there's a number of uh, people, mo bigger number every time interested. Kevin Kelly spoke at that conference, who's still trying to figure out what is sort of the movement and the next step, and he said something which he said, quantified self is actually trying to give people new senses. And the device you see behind me is called the North Paw. Um, any of you have ever been to hacker spaces? Hacker spaces? Even know what I mean? Okay, there's, there's one. Who doesn't know what a hacker space is? Let me ask you that. Okay, so that's something I can at least help you because then you definitely have to go. A hacker space is also something which is nothing with the business interest. It's just probably a place, I guess, I don't know, maybe somebody knows if there's someone in Eindhoven, uh, some uh, hacker space in Eindhoven, but there definitely are in Amsterdam, other places in the Netherlands. Um, normally they have like an array ranging from 3D printers, um, any type of uh, laser cutter or woodworking machine, a host of computers, networks, um, uh, electronics, so anything you can use to build and make stuff. And this device was built at Sensebridge, or sorry, Noisebridge, which is um, a terrific San Francisco hackerspace which I visited. It's actually an ankle bracelet. It, it's not finished in the sense that you would sell it, so I don't know that Philips would, I, I guess it, it wouldn't fit the current design standards, but the function is very clear. There's a range of 64 magnets inside, or actually very little actuators. And these actuators, they vibrate when you point the device north. So the device, when pointing north, vibrates. So these 64 segments give you an idea of where north is. When you're wearing this, and you will be wearing it if you wear it all day, after a few days you'll understand where north is, even almost without the device uh, all the time specifically being aware of what the device is telling you. It's just becoming part of your sort of senses. So in that sense, it's adding a new sense. And that idea is very interesting for me always to think about how can we develop these new senses? What, el what other new senses can we develop? So what types of technology can help us define, for example, a sense of I'm getting ill, not I'm, I'm ill. I mean, we have tools and technologies, but what senses could we develop that give you an idea just as um, before you hit the stress level going through transport in, uh, in London, what will help you define whether you probably will be stressful and how it will affect your day. So these extra senses are an interesting way of looking what quantified self can help with. Um, this is actually a <laughs> um, uh, the Gardner hype cycle but then very abstract. I, I define three trends and I will quickly go through them because other presentations I do sometimes have a load of examples. I can tell you a load more. You can also find lots of stuff on the website, quantifiedself.com, but mobile sensors and big data are driving trends behind the quantified self movement. <laughs> Just very quick, these are the apps that are also already named. Um, things like RunKeeper are nothing really special anymore if you're any sort of involved in this community. Uh, or even just have a phone. I mean, you don't have to be involved in this community. If you're just a runner, use RunKeeper. A lot of people will do that. And, uh, but actually, they're gathering a lot of, a lot of data, um, and they're also uh, still working on capitalizing on the data. They have something called the Health Graph, um, which is their API. So they are also trying to think, how can this be turned into a service? I mean, the, the RunKeeper app is actually sort of... Uh, just as, as Apple used the iPod to sell songs and MP3s to make their money, they're trying to, to use RunKeeper and see where actually they can use the data in other places. Um, HealthGraph is, is currently available. You can build apps on that, but a monetization model has not yet really been found, but they're 
just trying to put it out there and see, like these hackathons and events, what can come out of it in the, in the longer run. Um, this is another one. Um, I know Philips, uh, anybody in the room who worked on Vital Signs, the Philips app? That's interesting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We've uh, met at uh, other quantified self uh, meetups um, before, but um, uh, this app also enables to tell your heart rate from measuring your camera or from actually looking in your camera and measuring the blood, throat, blood flow through your face and therefore it can deduct your heart rate and um, I think the vital signs also does respiratory rate um, and a few other things, this one only does heart rate. But these apps, they don't require any special sensors, devices, just an iPhone with a camera. And therefore they can measure it and um, there are, let me go back one time, there are people now trying to figure out if they can find heartbeats for any type of person anywhere in the world at any time. Uh, Leslie Saxon, one of UC's um, cardiologists, is trying to do a project called Every Heartbeat. And she's trying to get all these measurements into a big data set so you can actually find out if we would take all the measurements of all the people here, who is out of the ordinary somebody who might have a condition or something which you wouldn't see otherwise. And um, so therefore big, da big data can help find these, um, uh, these anomalies. We think, so it was already mentioned, is a maker of these kinds of sensors and devices. Uh, this is my health graph, actually it works, for me at least. I was weighing about 94 kilos um, at one point and then I decided to lose weight. And I don't say the scale has helped me in that sense directly lose weight, but the fact that I can track it helps me stay motivated. Um, which also indicates another interesting problem for quantified self and for those of you who have to design services. There is this thing called plateauing. So at the end, I will probably, at least I try, hit somewhere between 80 and 85 kilos, which is my goal weight, and I'll be happy. But the fact is, if I want to stay on that, how do you keep me motivated, or how do I keep myself motivated to stay there at that point where I still am at a healthy weight, but I don't probably look at the data any day uh, or every day. So there's a lot of challenges. This seems very logical. You look at the data and okay, you're losing weight all the time and so, but that doesn't go on forever. At the, at the end, it sort of evens out. So how do you keep, so motivation and behavior design are very important aspects of that. Um, Fitbit is not a device which I already showed. Sleep monitoring is an interesting one. I can go on and on. There's loads of these examples, but think of something and there will be tools and techniques and sensors being able to help you measure that. Um, just four different things before I close up about uh, quantified self and big data. Um, what can you do with the power of data? So this is a picture of Larry Smarr, which is uh, formerly the head of supercomputing. I don't know by heart now the name of the exact institute, but he has access to a lot of supercomputers and things. He tried, uh, he actually started tracking a lot of things. So that ranged from doing, getting his blood work done to sampling a large part of his genome uh, and also actually um, uh, getting measurements from his stool, which is apparently not regular for a lot of people, uh, uh, understandably, but also very data intensive. And the fact that he had access to these supercomputers enabled him to get interesting measurements, which enabled him then again to find out a year and a half before doctors acknowledged it, that he had early onset Crohn's disease. This is something that the doctors really denied. He's, they said, this is not happening. You're sort of overanalyzing. You're one of these people who comes in with buckets of lo bucket loads of data, but you don't have anything wrong with you. That proved to be wrong. He could actually indicate, also based on scientific literature, that things were happening and he had the measurements to prove it that were out of the ordinary for people in his cohort, his age, and so on. That uh, indicated early onset Crohn's. There's a lot of power that comes with the fact that you have all these data, not for groups, not for like public health only, but also for the individual. Um, I think some uh, image, but humility in a sense that um, humility means you, there's a lot of debunking being done by the fact that we have a lot of user generated data in contrast with um, data generated from machines and all uh, bigger data sets. So for example, 23andMe, uh, you can sample your genome. These are data sets built by 
any type of people. They're not selected up front, they're not more healthy. So clinical trials, for example. Clinical trials are studies which have a lot more healthy people in a clinical trial because you have to be screened, because the basic have to be, you have everything, um, uh, actually everything is the same except for this one condition that you're trialing for. So in general, people in clinical trials are much more healthy than the average population. Not a lot of people with also diabetes or also these other diseases are getting into these trials. Now with the fact that everybody can get their measurement in, everybody can get their data set into that big data set, you get a lot more diversity and that is meaning a lot more uh, actually telling what the real world looks like. So if you talk to somebody with diabetes, they probably have a lot of other diseases, but clinical trials, for example, now try to focus on that one specific disease. So comorbidities and things like that are probably more often than not uh, let out of these things. Integration, the need for integration. Anybody has any idea what this is? Nobody? Nobody? Nothing. Go and do it. Sorry? No, it's not a blood test. It's, it's a spit test. It's, um, this is what you get when you order the 23ME kit. This is the spitting tube. And uh, at the launch, when um, uh, Sergey's brain wife launches on Wojcicki, they had spitting parties even. So everybody would get their kit out and they would go and actually they spit in the tube, they send it off, or she, uh, I think she collected them and then sent them to the lab. Um, this is, I'll get a picture. This is the kit you get. Um, but the integration and the thing that 23andMe uh, now has opened up an API. Um, uh, there's uh, patients like me. This is a famous example which has been used over and over again, but I'll repeat it once more for clarity. That is meaning more data sets that can be integrated with other data sets. And these integrations of data and data sets are not only valuable for that one user that uploaded their data, but for example, patients, and, uh, patients like me is making a very valid case for the fact that these combined data sets also prove to be a very interesting integration example of uh, research data, for example. So there are different uses uh, by taking that N is one, which quantified self represents most of the time and building that into N is a lot. So this is actually the outside of the kit which you get. Um, then there's the last one, workflows. Um, quantified self, big data, these are changing the workflows. Now it would be, um, I'm sick or I'm feeling sick for the last few days, I go to see a doctor. And the doctor will tell me or ask me what have I been doing the last few days, what I've been um, eating, what I've been exercising and so on. Anybody of you recognize what this device is? Anybody? This is what was talked about in the first presentation, the Star Trek fans. I, don't see, I don't think there are many. This is the tricorder they use. Somebody fell down, somebody was shot, somebody was feeling ill, they got out their tricorder and scanned the person and that immediately they would have a diagnosis. These kinds of things which enable you to get a very quick diagnosis or even not having even the need to take out the device but having a diagnosis, for example, you have a patch in your neck and having a constant diagnosis will mean that these workflows will be changing. So you'll get a measurement or a doctor calling you instead of you calling the doctor. That's another impact of quantified self and um, big data. Last slide before I close. Future directions, I was, I've, um, I was reading the, um, uh, uh, the report which you quoted from just yet. And one of the things was um, in, the, in the last section which was about the future, where should we go? And there were two options mentioned. There was the data-driven approach which you could follow or the user-centric approach. So the data would be, we have this big data set, there's all these interesting things which come out and we'll try and work with that data. So actually that would be what IBM Watson is doing, like tons of data and the anomalies will be something interesting to research and, and try. Or, this is the other one, this is, this is the Beam Brush. This is a project, um, I don't think they were on Kickstarter, but they were definitely crowdfunded and they had people putting in money to get it done. This is a Bluetooth connected toothbrush. So that is something, I guess, if Philips would be doing it, the impact would be much wider, but the thing is, people definitely want this. Um, it's already out there, it's being made, it's showing you how much you're brushing. There's another one from Green Goose, which you can attach to your normal toothbrush. So these things, the user-centric approach is a very interesting one to follow and find ways like Kickstarter or any other platforms to find out what users are actually wanting, how do they want it, and how much are they willing to pay for it, and so on. So that's an interesting, I think, uh, mention in the Philip research, which is well worth uh, exploring. Thanks for your time.
Thank you very much, Maarten. Are there any questions? Gee, nobody's incredible. Um, I mean, you, you talked a lot about health-related things, um, uh, but I, I have the impression that a lot of things are starting with things related to fun, and health initially is not related to fun. So are there trends see, foreseeable there? Are there products or examples of services? Um, well, I think the first sort of um, the thing that you mentioned is the health is not, de uh, is not firstly related with fun. I think I would uh, think otherwise. I think s having a healthy lifestyle, for example, mm -hmm. is fun. So if you can get that into people's minds, if their behavior becomes that actually living a healthy lifestyle is fun, uh, it will be much easier to, to convince people to do certain things. Um, there's definitely a trend, there's also a lot of things in health which are not fun, going to the hospital, having a treatment and so on. Um, we, had had, we have had these trends of gamification and getting points for everything and making it, making it a whole game. That is definitely part of, part of that solution. I also think that being able to, to take ownership of your data as a trend and being able to get more insight yourself, and, and just as with the data for public transport, it lowers your stress level. Mm -hmm. So not so much maybe fun, but more ease, and the fact that you're more comfortable with your current situation also on, um, based on your health will definitely be a trend which will be driven by this, this big data quantified self trend. So people will be feeling more in control. And I think it's not necessarily fun in that way, but it's, it's giving you a better and, and more relaxed way of dealing with issues of health and uh, uh, healthcare, maybe. Okay, thank you. Questions? Um, yes, the gentleman over here. Yeah, there is a microphone. One second. Good morning. Thanks for your presentation. I'm Manfred Lüt from Trustec. Uh, I, I think I would be, I would love to be a self tracker, but uh, I guess I would be interested to keep my medical records from all my doctor visits and stuff like that. Uh, actually, I'm coming now from Germany. Are you aware of trends in order that uh, we can keep uh, somewhere on a USB stick or somehow on the cloud uh, um, the own medical data? I think that would help. Yes, so the question is if, uh, if the, the medical data is also something you can keep yourself and keep track of. Um, I always try to distinct health and healthcare because I think, in my thinking at least, there's two domains which are definitely connected but different sort of angles and companies working on this. So if you look at the companies working on this, there are definitely, there actually are tons of companies. The thing which is lacking currently is the standards. Everybody is making their own tool set and trying to do it. Like I met with Ronnie Zeiger a, a couple of months ago who was formerly head of, of Google Health. Um, they've tried and they couldn't find a monetization model or actually they couldn't even get the people to cooperate to agree on the same standard. So they tried and they, they failed in that sense. Yes, there are ways of doing that. Actually, the best way is actually for now, and that I've seen very good examples, try to assess what is needed for your case. I've seen examples, people have pacemakers, their data about their pacemaker is very important. They want to try find out how can I get the raw data from my pacemaker, see what it is, and get it into my patient file. So if you look at all the bits and pieces that are out there, try to think about what is necessary for your situation, if you have a specific disease, a specific condition, and find specific tools for that, and then try to scale it from that. That is at least my point of view, which works. And there, I can talk to specific companies, but probably you don't have the time for that now, but there are companies doing, especially the bits and pieces approach, in my view, is very interesting. So don't do it all at once, but try to do the very specific parts, and like you use a device for specific things, try and integrate that with more data, and then work from that uh, and build it up. One other question over here. Yeah, it's fascinating. I understand that you quantify yourself, but the really power, I, I guess, is after you quantify yourself and you can form a group to quantify group together. Yeah. That, that, so, do have you think about this idea of the data you quantify yourself belong to you, so it's become your property. Have you think about the trading? Have you think about putting the data products together and yeah. make a group data, for example? Yeah, absolutely. The, the trading is, is it, calling it trading is very interesting uh, first because being able to, actually you, uh, they always say, right, if you don't pay for it, you are the product. So the fact is that the data that I generate is worth something because there are companies built on top of that data. Um, 
Um, for example, this one actually allows me to connect with Facebook. So I see, uh, I know Johan has a, um, a Nike fuel band and I can see what his fuel score is, so how he competes or how he ranks um, to me uh, in, the, in the stats. Um, but you can make far more interesting approaches also with health and healthcare and disease and so on by, by giving your data away. The difficult thing is uh, that is happening, but there's a lot of discussion about the ownership model. Who owns it and are you owning only your own data and when it gets anonymized and aggregated, do you still actually have a claim to part of the aggregated anonymized data because that is something that companies have done for you, you're not recognizable in that set anymore so where's the ownership then? So it's a difficult thing but it's definitely something I think that will happen more and more that actually you can keep sort of track of your data so the data is yours and you get actually sort of more opt-in and then also be able to pull out at a later stage, at least I hope that will definitely be one of the models that you can say, okay, I'm trying to retract my data from this uh, data set and I'll put it into that one because I get something back. Patients like me is the perfect example still. It's, it's generating these data sets based on individual data and for a greater good and it has a very clear value. So pooling data is a very interesting and worthwhile model. Okay, one last question. Yes. Thank you very much for your talk. My name is Kara van der Driessen from Filter Design. Uh, you talked about two directions, um, um, the data sets or uh, the user-centered uh, data. Is that either or? No, or I, no. no I think um, uh, these are two directions which are, they're already happening, so there's not a decision. For Philips as a company, as they wrote in their analysis, I think um, uh, it is sort of a strategic decision what you think will fit the company best. Like there's companies um, in the Valley, for example, you have a lot of engineers who are not very good designers in product sense, but they can do a lot of interesting things with big, big data sets. So they're a data-driven company. Philips probably has to make up its mind. Uh, as I said, uh, with the Fitbit, this one is, I consider rel relatively, within a small community, relatively successful. This is, the, the Direct Life never reached that stage where they, got it to be really successful and adapted by users. And like, I bought uh, the whole store when they were accidentally released. I, I bought like 60 of them and I sold them within one day for all these people I know who want one. That is sort of showing that there are people thinking, oh, I can do stuff. That is, I think, primarily based on the fact they have an API. So that's a service and a product and that's one sort of approach where you ask people, what do you want? Well, we want an API, we want to build stuff with our measurement data, and then we can build another thing and another thing and another thing. That's a user-centered approach. And then you have the big data set, data-centered approach. So if you're a company, and it can differ from product to product, I, I assume, but sort of strategically, you'll have to make a decision what kind of company you are. I mean, Microsoft has now taken a decision saying we're not a software company, we're a hardware company. These are big, very uh, large uh, impact decisions, but they're very, I think basic or needed for the basic idea of what are we doing here and why are we doing it and what should we do next. So there, there are two things which can come together or be different paths, but if you're working on a product, it's good to have that mindset at the back of your mind, like this is what we're doing and this is what we're doing it for. Okay, thank you very much, Maarten. <laughs>